Hello all, it's time for the daily read aloud of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, we're going to pick up with book 17 today, and if you remember, the gods are still meddling in this human affair, and frankly, I think the humans are probably getting tired of it. I know I would be, wouldn't you, if the tides of a battle kept changing because these gods are toying with you, rather than just, you know what, wipe them all out if you don't like them. So, book 17. During the violent fight over Cebrion's body, Achilles' young friend was in fact stabbed in the back by a spear thrown by Euphorbus. Well, remember, Patroclus put on Achilles' armor so that he could rally the troops as himself. But Zeus is using Patroclus as a kind of a chess piece. His armor came undone and his helmet, Achilles' pride, rolled in the dust. The wound was not mortal, but Patroclus felt he could no longer fight. Staggering and losing blood, he dragged himself back amongst the Myrmidons. But Hector saw him and did not hesitate. He lunged at him with a spear and stabbed him below the belt. Without uttering a sound, Patroclus fell to the ground. You thought you would take Troy, Patroclus? Hector exclaimed triumphant. Instead, I have killed you. This is the end of the road for you. You will not enter my city, but you shall serve as a meal to the vultures. That's right, Hector, replied Patroclus with a failing voice. Boast about my death. You have not long to live. Achilles himself will avenge me. You shall perish by his hand. Who knows, retorted Hector. Perhaps Achilles is to die before me. But Patroclus could no longer hear him. He was dead. Hector then stripped him of his armor and put it on himself and on his head, and he placed the helmet that belonged to Achilles, his greatest rival. Watching Hector's vainglorious act, Zeus muttered, Ah, unfortunate warrior, you wear the arms of someone who is feared by all, and you cannot feel that death is close upon you. No, your wife Andromache will not see Achilles' armor and helmet. I shall not allow you to bring them back to her as trophies. But in exchange for death, which is soon coming to you, Hector, I want to give you a great victory today. That's Zeus. And once again, Hector felt driven forward. Wielding his spear, he renewed his assaults on the enemy. They fought furiously over Patroclus' body. The Greeks would not tolerate, see, tolerate to see it taken to Troy and thrown to the dogs. The Trojans, on their part, could not lose such a testimony of their triumph. Taking their first stand in defending the blood-drenched body was Menelaus, who stabbed the young Euphorbus to death. Then Menelaus was joined by the awesome giant Telamonianias. Together they held back the first Trojan onslaught on their own. Gradually more warriors came to the rescue, and Patroclus' body was fought over mercilessly. On the one hand, holding him by his head and arms, the Greeks tried to pull him to safety toward the sea. On the other, tugging at his feet, the Trojans attempted to drag the corpse into Troy. Amongst the swaying ranks of the medley, whose intensity never abated, Hector and Aias looked for each other, never succeeding in coming face to face. It was almost impossible to tell whether it was day or night, or even whether the sun or the moon shone above them. Over the battlefield hung, 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 hung a blanket of dust under which the opponents clashed, struck, fell, killed, wounded, or died. It was to be a day of intolerable exhaustion, a day of stifling heat, a day without pause in which many would die. Greeks! We cannot return to our ships without Patroclus' body, someone shouted. We would, we would rather the earth swallowed us alive. Trojans, came the answering cry. Even if you are killed beside the corpse, let none of us retreat. Far from the conflict, Achilles' horse, Balius and Xanthus, horses, excuse me, Balius and Xanthus, had come to a halt and standing motionless they wept. Indeed, hot tears were streaming down their eyes and dropped to the dusty ground. These animals mourned their Patroclus, who had so often steered and driven them. Seeing their grief, Zeus himself was moved. I wish I had my thinking voice thing here, because I would stop and think about what did we talk about with myths and that sort of, and legends, that sort of thing, where and horses can't truly cry like that with tears streaming out of their face, falling in the dust. That's how you know this is a fake, a, a, a story, right? A legend, a myth. No, he said trouble. No, I promise you that Hector would never drive you. Take heart and do not be afraid to cross the battlefield in order to carry the loyal charioteer Altemidon back to the safety of the camp to rest. Escaping the reins of the ailing Altemidon, the two neighbor neighing steeds galloped off and entered the battle at full speed, making their way through the bewildered fighters. They pressed across the battlefield like a terrible vision and finally reached the seashore. The day was drawing to its end, and the fate of Patroclus' body was still uncertain. One of us, shouted Menelaus, must go to Achilles with the news of his friend's death. Perhaps when he finds out, he will come to come himself to save his friend's body. Antilochus, he went on, turning to a companion, the sad duty falls to you. Go to Achilles and tell him that Patroclus is dead. Book 18. Meanwhile, in his tent, Achilles was overcome by the, a dark premonition. His heart told him something terrible had happened. He stepped out of his tent and stood motionless, listening to the rumbling of the battle. It was growing nearer, as at it as at first it had grown further. The Trojans were therefore advancing again. 
Perhaps this is, means that Patroclus has been wounded or is dead, thought Achilles. But how could it be possible? Did I not tell him not to press on towards Troy? At that moment, Antilochus appeared. Achilles, an unforeseen misfortune has befallen us. Patroclus is dead. Hector has killed him and stripped him of his armor, and they are fighting over his body. On hearing the news, Achilles was thunderstruck. For a second, darkness dropped over his eyes. For a second, he was drained of his blood. Then he let out a howl of grief to the sky. Ah! and fell to the ground in great convulsions, as though he had lost his mind. He poured ash over his head, tore his hair with his own hands under his eyes of his, under the eyes of his appalled friends and slaves. Then he rose and held Antilochus's hand, who was weeping uncontrollably. Achilles ran to the sea. From the depths of the sea, his mother Thetis heard his cries. At once, gliding over the waves, she reached the shore and came to him. "'What is it, dear child?' she asked. "'Perhaps the Trojans have not retreated from the ships they wanted to set alight? Perhaps?' They did withdraw, mother, but Patroclus is dead, replied Achilles. I have lost him. I have lost my weapons. I have sent to death the friend whom I love better than myself, and now I can do nothing for him. Help me, mother. Help me to go back to battle, and may my destiny take its course. Sadly, Thetis said, Yes, my son. I shall be back at dawn to bring you new weapons. I shall ask Hephaestus to forge them for you. Wait for me. Then you can go back to battle, and may your destiny take its course. With these words, Thetis vanished. Um... Now, one thing to think about is, remember, we were talking about illusions, and we talked about like, the Achilles heel. One, what, what was unique about Achilles when we read that myth? Do you guys remember? Remember his mom had dipped him in um, a river stick? One of the, I forget which river. River sticks, maybe. Right by his Achilles heel, and he was invincible, except for that one little spot, which nobody knows about, of course. In the meantime, the Trojans had launched a new attack, determined this time to get a hold of Patroclus' corpse at all cost. Achilles had started to weep again when in dazzling light appeared Iris, the messenger goddess. Patroclus' body is about to be lost, and you, Achilles, you weep and do nothing? The hero muttered, Hera has sent you, Iris, and you reproach me. But how can I go to battle when I have no weapons? You need no weapons. Come out of your tent and show yourself at the trench where the Greeks are being driven back by Hector. Let them hear your voice. That will be enough. This is what Hera has to tell you. So Achilles left his tent. An aura of fire seemed to shine around his head. With long strides, he moved toward the trench beyond which the battle raged. Taking a firm stand, he let out a howl of grief, rage, and threat. The Trojans heard him, and perplexed, they came to a halt. Achilles cried again. The Trojans dared not press on. Their princes held the horses back, looking round anxiously. Is Achilles returning to combat? No. But for the third time, Achilles howled, and suddenly the Trojans were panic-stricken. They fled and never stopped running until they had taken refuge inside the city. So ended the day which could have brought them a decisive victory. The Greeks therefore retrieved Patroclus' body and carried it to Achilles' tent. Embracing it, Achilles wept. Patroclus, he said, I promise to bring you home alive and covered in glory. I did not keep this promise, but I shall keep another one. Before I join you in the kingdom of the dead, I shall kill Hector. Throughout the night, wailing and lamentations rose from the distraught Greek camp. Meanwhile, Thetis had gone to Hephaestus, the blacksmith god, and had found him among his puffing bellows, hard at work, beating the anvil with his mighty hammer. As he saw her, Hephaestus rejoiced and limped over to Thetis. He had never, never forgotten how she had hidden him and given him shelter in the sea when, as a child, he had run away from home where his mother, ashamed to have a crippled son, would have him locked up. "'Ask me whatever you wish, Thetis,' he said joyfully. "'If I can do it, I shall. Perhaps it is, al it is already done.' Thetis told him about Achilles' sad story and concluded, So, Hephaestus, I have come to ask you to forge a helmet, a shield, leggings, and armor for my son. He no longer has any of those, for Hector, the murderer, has stripped them away from his beloved Patroclus. You shall have what you ask for, replied Hephaestus, and at once he set to work in his smoke-filled workshop. First he made the shield, huge, sturdy, with a triple rim, and he engraved it with the symbols of the earth, the sea, and constellations of the heavens, also with pictures of cities, temples, and rural labor scenes. Then he started on the armor and forged one brighter than the blazing fire. He shaped a tall, shiny helmet to fit perfectly on Achilles' head. And on top of it, he placed a golden crest, trailing a long horse's tail. As for the leggings, he used tin so that they would be so they would be light to wear and would not hinder his running. Never had a mortal seen more beautiful or stronger weapons. When Hephaestus had at last finished, he handed the arms to Thetis, who swept down like a falcon from Mount Olympus to take them to her son. Well, once again, the gods are intervening. We have a few more chapters left. Um, you know, 
Hector doesn't stand a chance, really. Gods are against him, against Troy. So, yeah. anyway, check out what you need to do for this activity today, guys.